I'm Marcia Neskeman. I'm the director of the Institute of Advanced Studies, and I am very, very happy today to be welcoming colleagues to this hybrid seminar. And we have a real full house here at International House, as well as a number of colleagues who are online, and we will facilitate all the conversation and the dialogue between those two versions, the virtual and the real, um, in, in the course of this seminar. And it's a great pleasure to be welcoming um, Leanne Richardson, who has come to us from Georgia State University, and who's going to talk about a most fascinating most fascinating topic. I'm going to hand over to um, her host here, uh, Sarah Parker, in a moment to do a more formal um, introduction to this particular seminar and their collaborative project, the work that they're working on um, here through the IAS. But I want to say a few things about um, welcoming uh, fellows such as Leanne to the IAS. And it's a great pleasure to be able to welcome colleagues from a range of different places um, to, to come to us to spend some time on our campus to enjoy some collaborative uh, enterprise with us. Um, and in, in, in a kind of more personal sort of sense, it's very nice to host a, a seminar in which we have a full house of feminist humanity scholars sitting at the IAS. And so it's a very interesting and exciting time um, in terms of having some of those kinds of conversations as well, which we'd like to foster very much here. Um, it is a particularly exciting project that's an ongoing project and will have quite a lot of legacy um, coming from it. And I think that's another thing that we're hopeful that we want to keep in touch with this project and know how it progresses and how it develops. We will all see many interesting things from this over the next few years, and we're looking forward to that. Without further ado then, Sarah, if I can turn to you. Thanks, Marsha. Um, yes, I'm, I'm delighted to introduce Leanne um, here in person and to welcome her to Loughborough University. Um, so Leanne Richardson is an Associate Professor of English at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia, where she teaches and researches um, in British literature and culture, 1880 to 1920, um, which as many people will know is a real strength of research here in English at Loughborough too. Um, we have our Cultural Currents Research Group um, where Leanne's research absolutely fi finds a home. Leanne's latest book is The Forms of Michael Field, um, which was published by Polgrave last year. And this book explores the poetry and the poetic identity of Catherine Bradley and Edith Cooper, um, who wrote together as Michael Field. And of course, we'll be hearing more about them today. So drawing on new formalism and new lyric studies and using the extensive archival resources available to Michael Field scholars in the Bodleian and the British Library, um, Leanne argues that their modes of self-creation are analogous to their poetic creations and collaboration. And Leanne's book analyzes Michael Field's continual quest for the aesthetic forms that best express their evolving ideas about identity and sexuality, gender and sacrifice, lyric voice and authority. Um, I've read the book, I've reviewed the book. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. It's going to move studies um, in Michael Field forward and indeed lyric studies um, more broadly too. Um, and as Marcia said, there's many things that Leanne and I have been planning, plotting, working on together during her time here at Loughborough, including a digital edition of Caliroe, which is one of Michael Field's first dramas. And we've also been discussing um, a volume on Michael Field in context to which Leanne has agreed to contribute um, kindly. Um, as well as working on Michael Field, Leanne is also the author of The New Woman um, and Colonial Adventure Fiction in, the, in Late Victorian Britain, Gender, Genre and Empire. And she has also written articles on turn for the century women poets like Dolly Radford, someone I also um, work on, writers of empire like Olive Kleiner, Flora Annie Steele, and little magazines of the late Victorian era. And she's currently writing about the palimpsestic nature of Michael Field's diaries as they revise poems, re-narrate events, and commemorate anniversaries of births, deaths, and other significant events. And I believe that will be the topic of Leanne's paper today. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia and the whole IAS yeah. staff who have made me feel very welcome and arranged this event today. And thank you to Sarah and all of the Loughborough colleagues who are here today. Um, tomorrow is American Thanksgiving, and I am feeling very grateful uh, to be in. Um, Michael Field was a complex construction. 
the identity under which aunt and niece Catherine Bradley and Edith Cooper published 37 works of poetry and drama from 1884 to 1913, Michael Field was not merely the synonym, nearly the pseudonym of Bradley and Cooper. Michael Field became a lived identity as Bradley became known as Michael and Cooper as Field or Henry in their daily lives. Bradley and Cooper recorded their lives and the life of Michael Field in a joint diary they called Works and Days. An ideal form in which to express a complex identity like Michael Field's, a diary, no matter when it was written, can be considered a postmodern form because of the ways in which it re registers subjectivity. Felicity Nussbaum, in an early example of diary theory, notes that the self presented in a diary lacks an obvious center and a smooth continent continuity in its intermittent form and content. Hence the impossibility of creating a single unified sense of self in a diary, even one written by a single individual. For two writers, especially two who considered themselves closer married than Robert and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, the diary functions as what Elizabeth or what Rebecca Steinitz calls a technology of intimacy. Although the idea of a joint diary in 2022 sounds eccentric or maybe bizarre, historical studies of the diary form show that secrecy and individuality were not strongly associated with diaries before the 20th century. Steinitz admits that a joint diary is not common, but notes too that it's not wholly idiosyncratic especially within a marital or quasi-marital relationship. Because a married couple are one person under British law, Steinitz argues that the diary can perfectly embody the singular duality of the married couple, a singular duality like that of Bradley and Cooper when they are Michael Field. Carolyn Dever, whose Chains of Love and Beauty is the only monograph right now focusing solely on the Michael Field diary, argues that Bradley and Cooper don't recognize a distinction between their relationship as joint authors and their personal relationship. Um, commingling marriage and authorship quite literally, Michael Field finds in the diary a form doubly suited to express their singular duality. Today, I'll argue that Michael Field's diary not only demonstrates Bradley and Cooper's completion of intimate relationships with authorial identity, but also that the palimpsestic nature of these diary volumes helps to explicate Michael Field's creative method. The 29 diary volumes are literally palimpsests, as Marion Thames delineation of the diary's textures makes clear. The diary, she writes, is not made up only of handwritten texts in two different hands. The volumes contain a mixture of textures newspaper cuttings, rough and fair copies of poems, press flowers, copied out letters from correspondents, transcriptions of letters they sent to other, and all manner of loose leaf insertions. In addition to the various insertions, each contributor is prone to literally writing over her own or the other's text. And one, one inscribes poetry into the diary, the other often write edits right on, right on the page. The diaries are also figuratively palimpsestic, Bradley and Cooper metaphorically write over each other's diary entries as they sequentially narrate the same event from different perspectives. And more broadly, each new diary sheet layers over the page that came before, suggesting the inevitable accretion of meaning in the narrative of their joint life. As Virginia Blaine has suggested, the image of the palimpsest, which she takes from a Michael Field poem from 1908 called A Palimpsest, is an accurate way for scholars to imagine Bradley and Cooper's shifting and dynamic relationship. Blaine adopts this metaphor to resist the model of doubled oneness or sameness from which all possibility of difference has been expunged. Michael Field's lesbian ide identity, she says, is rather a site of ongoing contest and revision where meanings are constantly being tossed out and overwritten. Following on these insights, I contend that the palimpsest is the best way to understand not only their joint identity, um, but also their poetic. As a site of creation and of memory, the diary is a palimpsestic construction that reveals Michael Field's palimpsestic working method. The diary both perfects and illuminates the method by which they create all of their works. True to the duality within the single name, the diary of Michael Field has two writers, and their working method for most of their promotion. Poetic and dramatic works follows this model. One writes, 
the other rights, they combine their joint efforts to edit and publish all of their works as a single person as Michael Field. As I pile layer on layer here, I should probably pause to clarify, the diary is literally and figuratively a palimpsest. The Michael Field identity is a palimpsest, as Virginia Blaine has demonstrated. Their artistic method is palimpsestic. One writes, another writes, they edit and layer them together. And likewise, their poetic imagination is palimpsestic, refusing the single in favor of the multivalent, piling on rather than pairing back. Theirs is an aesthetic of simultaneity, refusing either or in favor of both and. The image of the palimpsest has a rich history of figurative use um, for representing life, life writing and memory, especially beginning in the 19th century. Um, advances in chemistry, writes Josephine McDonough, enabled layers of inscription to be recovered um, so that instead of scraping away and thereby losing access to the intervening strata, new technology feels the old without destroying the new. Um, a richly layered metaphor, the palimpsest can bring together writing and memory and time in productive ways. And today I'll talk about three different iterations of the palimpsest found in the diary, iterations that Sarah mentioned in her introduction, um, revising poems, re-narrating event and commemorating anniversaries. I'm especially interested in the ways in which Michael Field's diaries explode both the literal and the figurative meanings of the palimpsest as the entries surrounding the death of Robert Browning demonstrate. From 12 November, 1889, when they learn of his illness, through 30 December, the eve of his burial, the diary incorporates newspaper clippings of their published poem, newspaper articles about Browning. There's writing by Bradley and Cooper where each narrates an individual response to the same event, an early draft of this memorial poem that is revised on the page. Um, and although there's much to talk about here, I'll focus on the memorial poem to Browning that they compose and publish. This poem's final forms vary widely. And I say final forms because final form, singular, would be grossly inaccurate. Um, this folio page has five different versions of the poem, none of which is identical to that first draft. Um, Two of the versions are from newspaper clippings. Two, the first two handwritten are Bradley's hand. The last is Edith Cooper's writing. Um, all are by Michael Field. The newspaper version in the top corner is closest to the original draft, but it's still not quite the same. Um, the differences um, among these versions are both slight and significant. The image of falling leaves and their disarray is constant as is the tempest that blows them about. Two versions differ only in punctuation, um, but the poem ranges from four to eight lines and the religious overtones vary widely from imagining Browning in the hand of God, the capital G, to imagining him as like the bay tree whose leaves are plucked by its God. This is all very interesting, but the question remains, why should we care? What does it matter that Michael Field writes five versions of the same poem? I think this page of the diary is particularly instructive insofar as each of these five poems is the memorial poem to Robert Browning. Like a palimpsest, this page presents different stages of writing whose priority and relative importance is not entirely clear. The handwritten poems appear sequentially rather than overwritten, but the logic of the sequence suggests that the third on the page is the most recent, a supposition supported by its heading final form. Yet this poem conforms to neither of the published versions of the poem pasted in above and below, and we generally consider the publication as the authorized final version. Uh, the actual form the poem takes, however, is less interesting than the fact that Cooper imagined there could be a final form for this poem. I, I imagine an unwritten narrative um, for this page. Um, right? The three handwritten versions come first. The newspaper clippings are probably pasted in later. Um, because Bradley generally corresponded with publishers, it's possible that she ignored Cooper's preferences and sent versions that more closely corresponded to the poems written in her hand. It's also possible that she sent the final form version and the periodical declined to publish it. 
What we can know, however, is that even when its authors think they have produced a poem's final form, the work can always be rewritten and reformed. Nonetheless, even though the poem labeled final form is not the final form, Bradley and Cooper let that misleading title stand. Um, I propose that this is intentional and important. In some instances, Bradley and Cooper are willing to cross out or cover over writing that they wish to delete, but they have more examples of adding to than deleting from. For instance, this 1888-189 volume is the first of their joint diaries, and they originally titled it Ramble Home. Sometime later, they decided to retitle the diary Works and Days. But rather than cross out Bramble Poem, Bradley underlines it in red and adds in larger red letters with double underline, right, the new title Works and Days above it. So like a palimpsest that retains traces of its previous writing, the diaries do not stop being a Bramble Poem when they become the record of Michael Field's Works and Days. Likewise, the poem written in Cooper's hand was once its final form, and it will always have once been the final form. There is an aesthetic of an addition, of addition and accretion. And of course, the diary volumes record year after year after year, adding up to a whole that is considerably more than the sum of its parts. The 28 volumes are consistently organized around recurring events through the calendar year. New Year's Eve retrospectives, New Year's Day goal setting, Christmas and Easter, remembrances of the birth and death days of family and close friends. While Carol Endeavor is interested in the ways that the cyclical repetitive patterns of diurnal experience are used as a cover for their larger experiment with time and space, self and matter, I will next examine how Bradley and Cooper's recurring commemorative observances create a palimpsestic aesthetic. Bradley and Cooper's commemorations signify differently because of the diary form. Sequential writing compels contextual reading. Anniversaries, for instance, will be anticipated, their meaning in part dependent on a reader's expectation and colored by the writer's previous commemorations. And there's also evidence that Bradley and Cooper did look back to previous years because they'll mention what they had written two years earlier in the current commemoration. So I'll look at the diary entries commemorating Emma Cooper's February 1 birth date and her August 20 death date. She dies in um, 1889, just a few months before Robert Browning does. And Emma, by the way, is Catherine Bradley's elder sister, Edith Cooper's mother. So the 1889 entries beginning August 10 and extending through September 7 establish the terms that get wo woven throughout further remembrances of the date. These pages present a vivid picture of a disrupted household. They are chaotic with entries squeezed in and numerous insertions clearly inscribed at later dates. Indeed, many are doubly palimpsestic. Cooper writes entries on one page that repeat dates recorded just a few pages earlier in the diary. And I don't know whether she forgot that she wrote or if she just needed to write and write again and record the same date and often almost exactly the same things. Um, but it is, it's a clearly a chaotic time in the household. Um, what is clear in these pages is that Emma Cooper is cons consistently surrounded by Michael Field's poetry and by cut flowers, obsessively. I, uh, I could spend the entire time obsessively recording their obsessive um, delineation of every single text um, and flower um, for those for that entire month. Um, so they are surrounded by art and by nature turned into art. In the day before uh, Emma's death, Cooper makes the connection between death and art explicit, um, personifying death as himself an artist. And this says the great sculptor death has been firming the lids and brows and nostrils. He takes each beauty of form and solemnizes it in his great art. This passage serves to emphasize that all of the language describing Emma's death and burial is steeped in the material of writing and the language of art. The shaping power of these ideas of death and art are apparent on the first anniversary of Emma's death, which coincided with George Moore's glowing review of their play, The Tragic Mary. Bradley copies the entire review into the diary, and then Cooper comments, finding the conjunction of Emma's death anniversary and published praise of their art prophetic. 
Can it be that when the day she rose again to life, our art will attain a new life, will partake of a resurrection? The commemorations do not grieve Emma's death, but reimagine her life later on the same page. Last night, the strong sense of her freedom and eternal activity wrapped me secure from grief. Her motherhood was active in my soul. Her voice ran through me like an oracle of glad tidings of great joy. Emma becomes a muse, or as Bradley put it in a letter telling Robert Browning of Edmund's death, one who was no longer outside the artist, but with and of one's life and art. Commemorating Emma's death two years later in 1892, Bradley worries. We who are growing so close to the modern, are we growing further away from her? But then she writes in quotation marks, behold, I make all things new and adds in her own words, then the newness is an element of heaven. Bradley's quotation is from Revelations 21.5. And he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And although Bradley stops here, the verse continues. And he said unto me, write, for these words are true and faithful. So again, the remembrance of Emma's death is not only further inspiration to write, but an also an imperative to an ideal self, true and faithful, creating an element of heaven. Looking to the first birthday commemoration after Emma's death is instructive. It is here that Bradley writes over Cooper's grief to fully shift the terms of death from tragic stasis to creative inspiration. On the eve of her mother's birthday, Cooper inscribes a long poem into the diary and its final stanza reads, one by one the tombs are pressed in the boundaries of our breast Every year, the native charm of our being suffers harm. What it had not held before, it must cherish more and more till we scarcely breathe a breath that is ignorant of death. And our flames, as we grow old, saddened, live on burial mold. Thus we learn that we shall be healed no more, but cemetery. Here, Cooper renders <laughs> his death as virtually negating their own existence. They breathe death. They somewhat histrionically live death, right? Or at least the flame of their life lives on burial mold and their existence is entirely shaped and fostered by the tomb. Thus, they shall be field no more but cemetery. That line break, right? Requiring a capital F for field, right? Is brilliantly multivalent. But they are neither fruitful nor the poet Michael Fields. In Cooper's rendering, Emma's death is a literal dead end. It is not recuperated as a generative motive for art. Until Bradley squeezes in four alternate lines in tiny script, which I've enlarged a little there. She has a little asterisk so you know where it goes. <laughs> For our flowers, as we grow old, saddened live on burial mold, and the earth in us is made fruitful by the sexton's spade. Bradley's rewriting of Cooper's poem literally transforms the occasion of mourning into an inducement to creation. The flowers that have surrounded Emma and continue to surround her photograph on every death and birth anniversary, those flowers do not die because they're cut, they live on in her memory. And while their field might be a cemetery, it is fertile from dirt rich with decomposing bodies. And thus Michael Field remains fruitful. And a side note, I'm not sure how I feel about Bradley rewriting Cooper's grief. Um, it's, yeah, however, the, the poem is in the same rhythm and meter of William Blake's The Tiger. And I don't think any English speaker who knows poetry can hear that, that rhyme scheme and that rhythm without thinking of the tiger, um, which suggests that it's possible, I'm not sure. Suggests that she was perhaps unconsciously willing to forge another meaning, one that recognized the awesome powers of creation, but that was also perhaps frightened or chastened by those powers as sort of what immortal hand or eye dare frame their, by fearful symmetry. 
I'm still thinking of that one. Um, there are periods of years when Bradley and Cooper fail to mark the anniversary of Emma's birth or death or both. But when, even when they forget the anniversary, their belated remembrance is tied to the literary arts. The first anniversary of her death in 1891 found Bradley and Cooper in Dresden, with Cooper in hospital suffering from scarlet fever. On August 21st, the diary notes, and her day came yesterday in the midst of it. Quietly, we had to turn the page. The metaphor differently turns death into art, turns the non-recognition of the dead into a literal turning of the page. It is nonetheless another layer that comprises the life and art of Michael Field. As a recurring touchstone, the remembrance of Emma's Beth Durf, birth and death um, becomes aesthetic, a form of art, right? a shaping rhythm, as well as a guide to the principles by which Bradley and Cooper understand their art. They write and rewrite the story of Emma's loss. They figure and refigure their importance to their art and their selves. Um, the commemorations order the text and order their lives, and most significantly, the old is not lost, but merely rewritten. The new writing doesn't represent, however, evolutionary change or growth. It's part of a series of discrete events, of yearly commemorations. Um, they are su superimposed on one another, making meaning in relation to one another. Um, these yearly occurrences are isolated moments that are also intimately linked, existing each on top of each, which allows identity to be multiple. Two women can also be one man. To death to be just one stage in a continuum of experience. Emma merely moves from outside to inside their lives and art. And art to be the corrective to loss with words, the way to figure and refigure identity and death. Neither the old writing nor the new writing is sufficient. The layers of both create the meaning of their works and days. I'll address one last layering technique found in the diary. Um, Bradley and Cooper narrating the same event sequentially in their individual voices. These are really interesting in terms of narrative, um, what they choose to emphasize, how they frame the retelling of the same event, how they can subtly comment on authorial voice and point of view. And of course, again, these diaries entries both figuratively and literally are palimpsests. Um, For instance, 25 January 1904, Charles Ricketts visits. He has designed jewelry for each that each is wearing. And it's also the night that he reveals his latest de design, the Sabadee ring he makes for Bradley. But it is not jewelry on Bradley's mind. This evening also follows Bradley's gift to Ricketts of a pamphlet of her love sonnets. Cooper writes, now I must return to Monday, January 25th. But it's Bradley who begins. Bradley writes, after Cooper's introduction, Henry reads to him several of my sonnets while I am in a cloud of cigarette smoking, puffing out my atmosphere by the balcony window. I am well started now on this path of ab abstract passion I have chosen. The air is rather fine and trembling, and I suffer, and I can report nothing of what is going on around me. And that's her full report of the evening. I can report nothing. So Cooper does the reporting for Bradley, my version of January 25th, Monday, and, and then follow 10 pages of writing, of which this is one paragraph, which, but in the interest of time, rather than um, unpack the descriptions of this evening, I'll jump forward nearly a decade to a similar scene of reading, an episode that might be called by after Gerard Jeanette, palimpsestuous. Um, Jeanette de uh, defines a palimpsest as a text that encourages relational reading, like Joyce's Ulysses to Homer's Odyssey. A palimpsestuous text is a palimpsest in which several figures and several meanings are merged and entangled together in their inextricable totality. Sarah Dillon offers this explanation. Palimpsestuous relationality treads the line of the problematic of incest an intimacy that is branded as illegitimate since it is between those who are regarded as too closely related. And in, as in 1904, Cooper is again reading Bradley's poems aloud, again at the request of a man, 
of a man for whom Bradley has complex emotions. And not only is the scene similar, it is similarly narrated with one and then the other describing their individual impressions of the evening. So in September 1913, Cooper is dying of cancer. Her death will come just three months later. And their cousin, Francis Brooke, who as a young man proposed to Bradley only to be refused, is visiting. Cooper notes that someone proposes she read aloud from their 1908 volume of lyric poetry, Wild Honey from Various Times. She writes, I am moved to read Michael's poems to me. And she lists Old Ivories and a palimpsest from Wild Honey, um, Athos My Darling from Long Ago and A Girl from Underneath the Bow, remarking that this last was recited by heart. Um, and this is a fairly lengthy quote, but this is her description of the event. I am moved to show him my triumph and joy in this lovely praise, and in showing him, I also let my beloved realize what her poet's gift has been to me, her poet lover's gift. Think of it. She has often read these lovely poems to me. She has not heard them tender but high-voiced from my lips. It is paradise between us. When we're together eternally, our spirits will be interpenetrated with our love and our art under the benison of the vision of God. For it wants another. There was need of Francis to listen to Wild Honey. There will be need of God to assure that immortal oneness of love with love, of praise and being praised, and the response of the praise casting all joy into union with the poet lover. And it's difficult not to read this scene in relation to Cooper's 1904 reading at Ricketts request. In both cases, a third listener makes new meaning. This extra listener alters what had long been written and palimpsestically means something new when added to the existing text. And as with the commemorations, meaning means differently in this multi-layered context. Again, these differences are not gradual change or any kind of progress. These are discrete events superimposed, making meaning in relation to one another. Here, Cooper uses Bradley's love poems to her in order to reveal her love for Bradley. The true love narrative is between Bradley and Cooper, yet other loves and lovers are necessary to the expression and realization of this love. As Cooper writes, I believe it is only to him I could read what is so thrilling and sacred to my heart. In the 1904 scene, Bradley is unable to narrate, except to say that she has chosen the path of abstract passion and that she suffers. Right? In 1913, Bradley is again feeling passion, but without the suffering, even though she knows how ill Cooper is and how present the idea of death is. This is how she narrates her reactions. I find that I am listening to Henry's voice, Henny leading, reading my love poems to her aloud to Francis. For a while, I am in paradise, the same phrase. It is infinitely soft between us, warm buds open. I feel at least I have narrated with these years of pleasurable love. And Francis, who has loved me so well, listens to the singing around the boughs that is not for him, listening as he would listen to a nightingale overhead. This is an intense moment, a moment not of memory, but of creation. The palimpsestic repetition is both memory and creation, both recalling the previous scene and constructing a new one. Just as reading these poems aloud in the presence of someone new makes them newly signify, Bradley and Cooper continually acknowledge that creativity has no end point even a final form will not be final. Significantly, when Bradley and Cooper explicitly offered the image of the palimpsest as a metaphor for their lives together in the poem called The Palimpsest, they emphasized the continuity of the text rather than the changes it would undergo. And of course, it appears in the diary, right? First in um, Cooper's hand with Bradley's changes to the last line, and again in Bradley's hand. This is the poem in its entirety, published in 1908 in Wild Honey. The rest of our life must be a palimpsest, the old writing written there the best. In the parchment hoary lies a golden story, 
as mid secret feather of a dove, as mid moonbeams shifted through a cloud. Let us write it over, O oh my lover, for the far time to discover, as mid secret feathers of a dove, as mid moonbeams shifted through a cloud. And the poem begins palimpsestically with the ellipses suggesting the existence of some previous writing. Um, turning the usual valence of the palimpsest upside down, the new writing doesn't supersede the old. In this rendering, the old writing written there is the best. Right? This line is arresting, though, because the phrase writing, writing written right, sounds redundant. Right? By definition, writing has been written. But rather than a careless flaw, the writing redundancy prefigures the repeated couplets that close the next two stanzas. Ad mid, as mid secret feather of a dove, as mid moonbeam shifted through a cloud, describes both the golden story hidden in the parchment hoary and the narrative that the far, far time will discover after they write it over. Their united life is, even when written, experienced as writing in the same way. And this, I propose, has to do with the nature of writing, the nature of identity that writing produces, um, because art and life, writing and memory, uh, living and creation, all are inextricably twined and each can be revised and rewritten. It's tempting to read a palimpsest autobiography, and to be sure, Cooper counts it as one of Bradley's love poems to her. But scholars have generally pointed to the fact that Bradley and Cooper both converted to Catholicism in the year previous to the publication of this poem, and thus read its imperative to write it over as turning the page on their physical union in order to turn to spiritual matters. Um, the poem, however, in the diaries in 1906, the year previous to conversion. Right? But even if the conversion had prompted this poem, the images of the feathers of a dove, and the moonbeams through clouds are equally pertinent to both pre and conversion and life. So rather than parse the biography, I want to attend in my last moment to the poem's conflation of writing and life. Our life with its plural pronoun and singular noun must become a palimpsest consisting of a golden story that the speaker and my lover write over. The old forms, however, will not be lost. The truths and the secrets remain, and their life is built through these stories and from the fullness of experience. Life is the accretion of the narratives and poems and newspaper clippings that form the layers pressed together in the book of their lives. Any final form should always be considered as provisional, open to rewriting, and understood in the context of the palimpsest. For Michael Field, texts like lives and life writing are dynamic, open to revision, always already rewritten.